those um, areas of the world which are still um, uh, using fluconazole monotherapy, it's between 50 and 60 percent. And there are a large number of um, countries in Africa that are still using fluconazole monotherapy where, and in those areas, um, amphotericin B is, is not a registered um, medication. So we are struggling for, for registration for fluconazole, and there are some parts of Africa where amphotericin B is still not registered. Um, cryptococcal meningitis causes about 15% of AIDS-related deaths. Um, and so it's, it's certainly something that we need to improve our, um, our treatment of. So the um, HIV Clinician Society a couple of years ago updated the cryptococcal guidelines and the basis for that um, update was really um, uh, a trial called the ACTA trial, the Advancing Cryptococcal Meningitis Treatment for Africa trial, which was an open label phase three randomized non-inferiority multicenter trial. And it looked at five treatment um, arms. And um, by the time the South African Clinician Society had um, uh, looked at updating their, their guidelines, um, the, the six and 10 week results um, uh, were available. Um, and uh, since then, the, uh, the ACTA trial has released a brief communication in 2020, which uh, reported on the one year mortality outcomes. Um, and they had five treatment arms in, um, in the trial. And you can see them listed below. They were a uh, uh, fully oral um, option, which was two weeks of flucytosine and fluconazole. Uh, one week of amphotericin B and fluconazole, one week of amphotericin B and, flu and five flucytosine, two weeks of amphotericin B and fluconazole, and two weeks of amphotericin B and, and flucytosine. And at that stage, uh, before the update, um, our recommended um, uh, treatment, our recommended guideline was uh, two weeks of amphotericin B and fluconazole. Um, and the one week amphotericin B and fluconazole um, uh, option was shown to be non-inferior. And the one-year mortality um, predictors were that the probability of death from the one week of amphotericin B and, and 5 flucytosine was 27.5%. You can see that a week of amphotericin B and fluconazole really doesn't do very well at all. Um, the difference was, was in fact, um, non-significant. But uh, when you look at the numbers, you know, you kind of get the, you kind of get the feeling that... Um, that amphotericin B um, and flucytosine is, is certainly the way to go, but you know, technically it turned out to be um, to be non-significant, but certainly non-inferior. Um, and there are some graphs just to to show you. So this uh, so B is the the ten week data and C is the the one year data, um, and you can see that it's that the the um, the graphs are maintained. Um, from the from the early report until the one year report, um, there's just a little bit of a, a switch around between the um, the two week amphotericin flucytosine um, and amphotericin fluconazole um, outcome, but um, you can see that certainly the amphotericin B and flucytosine at one week was um, associated with with uh, improved outcomes. So. Obviously, the trial says you give amphotericin B and fluocytosine. What's the issue? Why are we even talking about it? And so the issue is obviously that fluocytosine is not really available. Um, and those of us who work in central sites have been lucky enough to have access to fluocytosine over the last couple of years. But certainly the vast majority of the country does not. And certainly the vast majority of the, of the continent does not. So this is a, um, a document that's been produced by, the, um, by MSF. Um, and it shows the map of Africa, obviously, with... Um, um, uh, different colors showing um, access to fusitazine. And we fall into the, the pale green area, which is some national program usage with up to 35% of patients having access. And I would venture to suggest that certainly 35% certainly of patients do not have access to flucytosine. So at um, our hospital, you know, we're a, a tertiary center in, in the middle of Johannesburg. We do outreach to two uh, secondary hospitals, um, and that's uh, Bertha Kloa in Germiston and Edenvale Hospital. And those two hospitals, which are closely associated with our hospital, do not have access to, um, to flucytosine. So they're still giving up the B and fluconazole. So, yes, there are some central sites that do have access to fluocytosine through donor programs, um, uh, which have been quite successful for those who have had access to it. But there's a, a lot of uh, there are a lot of people who require fluocytosine who are not receiving it. So what about uh, whether it's affordable? Um, so treating cryptococcal meningitis is not cheap anyway, but it could probably be 
uh, cheaper. So um, shortening the duration of therapy and the admission to a hospital is likely to have um, some impact. Um, so this is a, a graph from um, a, a local um, study that was done. Um, the, and uh, they used the, the treatment cost of decytosine for a 50 kilogram um, person per day. Um, and they, uh, they decided that that would cost um, $9.38. Um, and you can see that for um, each patient to receive a week of amphotericin B and 5 recitazine, it's going to cost $2,698. To receive two weeks of amphotericin B and uh, flucytosine, it's just going to be very, very um, slightly more than that. A week of amphotericin B and fluconazole is the cheapest option, but we know that ha that has very, very poor outcomes, so that's um, not really an option. Um, and two weeks of, of amphotericin B and fluconazole is um, a little bit cheaper. It sort, sort of falls um, between those two, those two um, options. And then the oral option for patients who are not going to be able to receive amphotericin B um, uh, also falls um, between those two, those two options. This again is from the document um, uh, compiled by, by MSF looking at costs in South Africa. Again, this is a slightly different. It looks at costs per thousand patients for a two week induction phase. So that would be amphotericin B and fluconazole induction. Um, and that would cost um, just over $2 million. Whereas for amphotericin B and 5 fluocytosine, that's uh, pretty much half. So um, despite, the, um, despite the costs, you know, um, flucytosine seems to be more expensive than fluconazole. Despite the costs of the drug itself, if you factor um, a number of different things in, so your hospital basic costs, the, the, the cost of medical staff to look after those patients in hospital, the number of tests that you're going to be doing um, over a two-week period compared to over a one-week period, um, including obviously the medication, um, the medication costs. And so um, it looks really like giving amphotericin B and um, 5 lucytosine is a very effective um, uh, option from a cost benefits point of view. Interestingly enough, looking at lip liposomal amphotericin, which is um, the third bar down, it's not substantially more expensive than using amphotericin um, deoxycholate. So um, one hopes that eventually we, um, in addition to having access to flucytosine, we'll have access to amphotericin, to liposomal amphotericin. So what is flucytosine? So flucytosine is a uh, fluorinated cytosine analog with antifungal activity. Um, it's an old drug. It was first developed in 1957, so it's 64 years old this year. By itself, it has no, um, you know, given... As is, it has no antifungal activity. It has, um, it has to be metabolized first. Um, it's deaminated to 5-fluorouracil, and 5-fluorouracil is substituted for uracil in RNA synthesis. Also, a downstream metabolite, um, fluorodeoxyuracilic uric acid um, monophosphate inhibits um, uh, thimidylate synthase, and that interrupts nucleotide um, metabolism and DNA synthesis. And ultimately, if you interrupt the RNA synthesis and you interrupt DNA synthesis, the organism can't make um, protein. Um, and I put a nice um, uh, picture of a molecule in the corner there. And since I'm sure most of us are not familiar with molecules, that's actually a molecule of, of chocolate. All right, so it's active against yeasts, it's active against candida species and against, and against cryptococcus, um, against some of the fungi causing chromomycosis and aspergillus and uh, aspergillus species as well. It is possible that some fungi may have intrinsic resistance, resistance to flucytosine, and if you give flucytosine by itself, you are likely to end up with um, resistance. So monotherapy is associated with the development of resistance, and it's not um, advised. There is some interaction with amphotericin B. There's postulated synergy um, between the two drugs, although that's um, uh, it's not guaranteed. It's not um, something that, uh, that everybody um, believes. Um, and there may be decreased elimination of flucytosine when given with amphotericin B um, related to its um, renal metabolism. So it is rapidly absorbed orally with high bioavailability, which is why it can be given um, uh, as a tablet. Uh, there is an IV formulation, but we um, have the oral formulation available. 
the peak concentration occurs um, after one to two hours. So if you are performing therapeutic drug monitoring, which is what a lot of um, international guidelines recommend, um, our guidelines do not, but um, many international guidelines will recommend it. Um, you sample at two hours after the oral dose for the peak level. And the peak level that you're looking for is between 25 and 100 milligrams per liter. And what you're looking for is you're looking for tox uh, essentially toxic levels. Um, so you don't want the level to be above 100 milligrams per liter. It is highly water soluble. It is not protein bound and it is eliminated um, almost essentially by glomerular filtration in the kidney. So our new guidelines from 2019, not that new anymore, although it feels like we've done, you know, so much time has passed so quickly in the last 18 months that they feel new still. Um, the new guidelines recommend a reflex CRAG screening at CD4 counts of less than 200 and an LP for all patients who have a new CRAG positive test. And then the, in terms of treatment, so amphotericin B at one milligram per kilogram per day, in addition to flucytosine at 100 milligrams per kilogram to day, uh, per day in four divided doses over a week, and then a one week of high dose fluconazole, um, and that constitutes the induction phase um, and then you will move to, to fluconazole um, maintenance therapy. All the alternatives are, so um, the amphotericin B and flucytosine is the recommended treatment. There are alternatives that you can consider if flucytosine is not available or you or amphotericin is not avail available or you can't give it for some reason. So amphotericin B deoxycholate and fluconazole at 1200 milligrams a day for two weeks or flucytosine and fluconazole. Um, uh, for two weeks. Um, this is a nice little um, cheat sheet um, in terms of how many tablets that actually is. So the flucytosine comes in a 500 milligram tablet um, and it's 100 milligrams a day or 25 milligrams um, per kilogram uh, every six hours. And um, obviously it's, you know, you're going to get um, numbers that don't quite add up to 500 milligrams. Um, but you need to give the, the 500 milligrams in a dose as close as possible, obviously. Um, and this is a, 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 useful, um, a useful cheat sheet for, for figuring out how many tablets you need to be giving your patient. So what to do in renal dysfunction? So if we're giving amphotericin B, um, we are always concerned about um, renal dysfunction. Even um, liposomal amphotericin B is not associated with um, a zero risk of, of the development of renal dysfunction. And obviously it's more likely to occur with um, amphotericin deoxycholate. So if your uh, creatinine clearance is less than 50, your first prize is liposomal amphotericin if you have it available. And every now and again, we have some liposomal amphotericin B. Um, certainly, we have more patients who would benefit from it than we have um, access to it. But liposomal amphotericin B, um, and to remember that the dose for liposomal amphotericin B is, is higher than for deoxycholate. Mm -hmm. And then you give flucytosine dose adjusted for creatinine clearance. And then followed by a week of glucosal, again, dose adjusted for creatinine clearance. The second prize is if you have to give um, deoxycholate, you give the same dose, one milligram per kilogram per day, with flucytosine and um, a week of fluconazole. It is only a week um, of therapy. So um, you hopefully will be stopping your amphotericin B after a week. And if you manage the, the the, specifically the fluids um, with great attention, you can probably get through that week of, of giving the patient amphotericin B deoxycholate without um, significant worsening of, of the renal function. So if your renal function is significantly worse, if your creatinine clearance is less than 30, then the first prize again is um, liposomal amphotericin um, at the same dose um, and the uh, flucytosine and, and fluconazole dose adjusted according to creatinine clearance. Your second prize then is the fully oral um, option, which is flucytosine and fluconazole, both of them dose adjusted um, for two weeks. And then the third option, which is much more um, labor intensive. So you would give 0.7 milligrams per kilogram as a single daily dose, um, as a single dose, and then you would give it every other day if the um, creatinine remained stable. So obviously that requires a lot of monitoring. Um, and 
obviously then you would give the flu the fluconazole um, dose adjusted for for creatinine clearance and you would give that for two weeks so um that's not an, an ideal option and we know that the outcomes for cryptococcal meningitis are, are poor anyway um so we would want to um uh, we would want to see if possible to to use the um to use either the the fully oral dose or the liposomal amphotericin b so this is how you dose adjust. So this is from Sanford, um, uh, the Sanford guide. This, this is published in the South African guidelines, um, and it gives you an idea uh, of how to dose adjust fluconazole and flucytosine. Um, this guide suggests that even if your GFR is less than 10, um, you don't need to reduce the dose. Um, obviously, every case is individual, and um, it's... Uh, and it, there may be other uh, factors that will impact on your decision as to whether or not to, to continue with a one milligram per kilogram or to reduce the dose to 0.7 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and just and um, also just to mention, if the patient is on dialysis, that fluconazole and flucytosine um, do need to be dosed after dialysis. So they are not removed by, by renal dialysis. So what about flucytosine toxicity? So flucytosine is generally mild. Uh, the toxicity is generally mild. Um, we don't really have um, patients complaining um, too much about the gastrointestinal effects. Certainly nausea and vomiting are associated and have been described. Um, one of the suggestions in terms of uh, managing those gastrointestinal side effects is to split the dose. So if you're taking four tablets or three tablets, you can um, split the tablets up over about, um, so every 15 minutes or every 20 minutes you take a tablet, um, and that seems to uh, be reasonably effective at reducing the, um, the side effects. Um, GI inflammation and ulceration has been described, so colitis and, and perforation have been um, described, but it's extremely rare. Um, it is associated with um, increased um, liver enzymes and possibly jaundice, and again, hepatic necrosis cases have been described, but it's extremely rare. One of the other concerns is certainly cytopenias, um, and you will see that um, a full blood count is recommended as part of the um, uh, dosing schedule, I mean, part of the laboratory monitoring schedule. Um, but the cytopenias generally are likely to occur um, at high drug levels, so drug levels beyond outside of the therapeutic um, range, above 100 milligrams per litre, and when given for long periods of time. So for the week that you're giving the flu cytosine, um, even if you're not doing any therapeutic drug, drug monitoring and, you, and you're not sure what the levels are, it's a short enough period of time that those cytopenias are unlikely to occur. Um, just um, from an anecdotal point of view, uh, we don't use flucytosine for many other things, but we did have a patient recently who was receiving flucytosine for a long period of time um, for a candida auris um, uh, infection. And um, he certainly developed uh, cytopenias, which we believed at the time were, were related to the flucytosine. So how do you manage the, the cytopenias? So you just need to make sure that your dose is correct. So if your patient does have some degree of renal impairment, you need to make sure that you are dose adjusting um, correctly. Always worthwhile considering alternatives um, to, to flucytosine as a cause of the neutropenia. If there is a severe neutropenia, um, so that's four, you know, less than four or 500 um, cells, then you would reduce the dose of the flucytosine. You would repeat the neutrophil count immediately um, if that is an, is an option for you where you work. Um, and if you have confirmed the neutropenia, then you withhold the flucytosine until the counts recover and you substitute the fluconazole for um, flucytosine. It may be that um, by the time the counts recover and you have an option to reintroduce the flucytosine, you feel like the patient has received a sufficient dose of amphotericin B and fluconazole to constitute a, um, a, 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 an induction phase but um, always bearing in mind that the flucytosine and amphotericin is um, a better option in terms of long-term outcomes. All right, so this is my, my last um, slide in, in uh, terms of safety. So flucytosine in pregnancy, so our current guidelines are going to recommend that standard therapy for treatment of, of HIV-infected pregnant women with cryptococcal meningitis. However, flucytosine is a category C drug for pregnancy. And so the recommendation would always be to to balance the um, uh, to balance the, the 
the risks against the benefits. And I, I think if, if we consider um, the, the um, mortality associated with cryptococcal meningitis, um, especially with substandard therapy, if we, are, if we are considering that the standard of therapy includes flucytosine, um, one must remember that the mortality is very high, the short-term mortality is high, and the long-term mortality associated with cryptococcal meningitis is high. Um, the flucytosine is associated with um, uh, teratogenic changes, but um, one must also remember that um, a you know, mother who dies from cryptococcal meningitis the fetus is going to die from is going to die as well, and you know, a um, mother who dies at a year or at six months or at four months um, following substandard treatment for cryptococcal meningitis may leave an orphan child um, behind. So one needs to to balance the very um, um, high risk of mortality and morbidity associated with cryptococcal meningitis against um, the um, the benefit of providing um, the best standard of the best okay, standard of care. So our current guidelines okay. recommend that if an HIV infected pregnant woman um, presents with cryptococcal meningitis, they receive standard of care, including fusitis. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Stacey, for enlightening us around the use of 5 flu in cryptococcal meningitis. I mean, clearly this is a disease with a very high mortality, and we should do everything we can to reduce that mortality. And clearly 5 flu is an important drug. <clears throat> I've been waiting for questions to come through in the chat, and while people are formulating their thoughts, I was just wondering, from your experience, how much of toxicity have you seen that could be attributed to 5 flu So, So I must be honest, with, with the short... The short duration that um, that we use it for, we don't really see significant toxicity. I mean, I think we still see more toxicity from the amphotericin B that we're giving than we do from the flucytosine. Um, you know, the one case where we used it for an extended period of time, we think that it did induce um, some bone marrow suppression. But for the week that we have been, you know, we use it for for the for amphotericin B, we really don't see um, significant toxicity. Yeah. And, yeah, I think it's a, a fairly benign drug to be giving for that period of time. That, that has been our experience here as well. And by the time you discover the toxicity, the week has passed and you don't need the drug any it's longer, which is that. really good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we have used it for a prolonged period in a patient who had recurrent cryptococcal meningitis and we wanted to sterilize his CSF. But what we've noticed is that it was actually very well tolerated. It was a young chappy, so... Maybe it was his youth on his side, but uh, we really didn't have any problems. So it's, it's a drug that's easy to administer. One of the challenges we have had using it is the four times daily dosing. Have you, have you come across that as a problem in your, with your use of the drug? Um, not, not routinely. I mean, I think intermittently. Um, so, so we have all our, our cryptococcal meningitis patients concentrated in one ward. Um, and so they... Uh, the sisters, I think, are are used to treating those patients, and you know, I think they've just become used to and and aware of the fact that it is um, a regular dosing um, schedule. So we have we have that advantage. But um, yeah, I do I do think you know it doesn't it doesn't really fit in with all the other dosing schedules and the and the medicine rounds that the sisters have to do. So it is a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Um, but I think when people are familiar with it and they're aware of it, it's it does become a little bit easier. Yeah. In, in our case, it has been a challenge simply because we have got cryptococcal meningitis spread across all the medical yeah. wards. Yeah. And uh, the, what happens is that the nurses give the patient the medication and says, you know, you need to dose yourself four times a day. So good luck with oh. that. <laughs> and these are not particularly well patients. Every day feels the same. Uh, all hours the same. So they have been mess ups along the way. So that has been a real challenge. That's why I'm yeah. so pleased that the uh, DNDI is looking into a long release formulation that would make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And we're also considering the possibility of using 5 flu cytosine as an outpatient on an outpatient basis in, in patients that can be released from hospital earlier with fluconazole. And yeah. if, we, if it goes less frequently, then we're more likely to get good adherence. Yeah. So Stacey, we, we do, you've done an excellent job. Everyone seems to be pleased with what you have said. And while well, there are no, there are no questions, so we'll move on to the next session, but please stay on. Yes, and, uh, there are two questions the in the well. chat that I believe you can't see. So if I can read them to you, given their importance and clinical benefit for please, patients at need, 
having access to flucytosine and also despite numerous clinical motivation and follow-up attempts, why is SARPRA taking so long for its registration? That's the first question. So uh, it is to species. comment on yeah, SARPRA processes. I think, I, think the, <laughs> uh, I think the next um, session is, is going to deal with the operational challenges associated yes, with yes. flucytosine. So perhaps that can wait until... I agree with you. It's, it's, it's time already, but... Yeah, and it's a huge problem, and I think Stacy is Stacy is correct. We we might address that at the next session. So maybe Jürgen should take a note of that. Is the other question, uh, Lauren? You mentioned two questions, Lauren. Um, the second question is also about the next session. Why has the rollout of lucytosine been so poor in South Africa, and are there issues with the cold chain? And perhaps we can leave that over for the next session. Yeah, excellent. I think that's a good idea. I'm glad those questions are coming in. It 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 it, it clarifies the need for the, the next session. So I will introduce you to the next session, and maybe you can start I'm, switching screens. Go ahead, Stacey. Okay. All right. All right. So we, what we've got next is a panel discussion around the challenges experienced in operationalizing access to cytosine. This session will be, will be moderated by Dr. Jürgen Pillay, and I'll just give you a little preamble about Dr. Pillay. He's the director of CHAI in South Africa since June 2020, and he comes with ex extensive experience working with the Department of Health in South Africa. He was the deputy director general for health programs uh, for the National Department of Health, and prior to that was the director for strategic planning, and prior to that was the director for district health systems. So I cannot think of anyone who has got a more intimate experience and understanding of the workings of the South African healthcare system. So I think he's, he's the excellent person to chair this and probably doesn't need the panel around him. He can do it all on his own. Anyway, so what we're going to talk about is uh, Dr. Jürgen uh, Pillay is going to do this session. He'll introduce the different panelists and the discussion will be around how we can get 5 flu cytosine accessible to everyone within the healthcare system. Jürgen, the mic is yours. Uh, yes, thank you very much and good morning to everyone and uh, welcome to the panelists. Um, so the way we'll run this is that I'll ask each of the uh, panelists to speak on their experiences with using uh, 5FC for about five minutes. We should then have about 10 minutes at the end for a, a more fireside a chat kind of uh, discussion. Uh, so let me introduce the panelists. I'll introduce everyone up front and then we will uh, get, get, get going. And thanks to Sarah for her overview uh, of the use of the various uh, treatment regimes currently and uh, and the clinical guidelines. Um, so I'll introduce them as, as they would be speaking. And so the first speaker is uh, Dr. John Black. Uh, John is an infectious disease physician at Livingston Hospital. Uh, he trained at UCT and uh, started working at Livingston in 2014, uh, where he started an ID unit. Uh, John is involved in research on MDR-TB, TB meningitis, and cryptococcal meningitis. And lately, he has devoted time to treating a lot of COVID patients, which I'm sure he will reflect on a little bit as well, John. Um, so so that's, that's Dr. John Black. Uh, the next panelist um, will be uh, Dr. Peto Mangena. Uh, just looking for my notes for Peto's CV. Uh, Peto CV is a one-liner that, that I got at least, and Peto, you might want to say a bit more when you speak, is a trained physician and nephrologist. Um, so that's uh, Dr. Mangena. Uh, I think everybody knows Eunice, so I don't think there's much uh, much I can do to introduce Eunice. Uh, he's already introduced himself as an associate professor and chief specialist and head of the department of infectious diseases at UKZN, and uh, he's the president of... Uh, the society. Um, and then finally, we have Jackie uh, Voje from the Western Cape. Uh, and Jackie will be speaking about her experiences in introducing uh, 5FC. She's uh, employed as a pharmaceutical policy specialist in the Western Cape Department of Health. She's a registered pharmacist and has completed a master's degree in HIV management. And she supports the provincial health programs by providing clinical and pharmaceutical support. So with those introduct introductions of our panelists, uh, John, 
in Livingston, you've been using 5FC. What's your experience? Uh, and uh, besides your experience, can you tell us what challenges you've experienced and what do you think we can do about them, both in the Eastern Cape and more broadly? John, over, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Jürgen. Um, we've been using a uh, few cytosine for probably five years now. We started off in a, in a very small way treating those patients with complicated issues and we, we initially applied for it through a Section 21 application. Um, it was approved by our local therapeutics committee and we got quite a lot of experience there and then finally we we connected with Chai, who then gave us a good supply of, of the flu cytosine, and it's really revolutionized the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. We've got a lot of patients, you know, in a resource poor setting where for nursing management is, is really difficult, your fluid management is difficult. And we certainly, on a review of our cases, probably the first 150 cases showed a reduction in mortality. We also, a uh, reduction in hospital stay. And the patients just did much better. And I don't think the, there's any doubt that the use of flucytosine is really what, what, what we need. Um, the issue really is around the access to the flucytosine. Just, you know, with, with access through, through CHI and the, and the access program, you know, the issue about using it and protocols and all of those things are fairly simple. I think the biggest issue is that if you've got a steady supply and you know that's what you can use, the training and the implementation of protocols are, are very easy. So to, to draw up a protocol, I mean, the, the Clinician Society has a lovely, lovely document that's, that really outlines how you use it. We certainly had a protocol prior to that. And once it became standard of care in our patients, the uptake was incredibly good. The training was easy. And despite you know, uh, interns and and medical officers rotating, it was very, very much just became a, a standard of care in the hospital and very low toxicities and just generally better outcomes. The issue really for us was expanding the access because, you know, this is not something that only occurs in tertiary hospitals. A lot of cryptococcal meningitis will occur at the regional hospital and district hospitals. And our pharmacists were able to liaise with pharmacists in other hospitals. So we were able to expand that access to another number of regional hospitals and, and district hospitals in the area. And they have started treating cryptococcal meningitis there with flucytosine. And I think the, the overall feeling is that people really like the versatility of it. When you've got renal impairment and you've got other issues that you can have an oral regimen where there's amphotericin B toxicity and it really is the way to go. The concern, obviously, is the number one is the, 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 the equitable access. We obviously want as many people on this drug as possible, and we've certainly managed to now get access in Buffalo City or East London, um, as well as other areas, but there's still large areas within the Eastern Cape that do not have access. And to procure it outside of an access program is a very costly thing. And I know the EML has reviewed it and they have accepted it as a, as a, they support the use of it. And um, they've also done the, some, some cost, cost effective analysis, which shows that it's very good. But unfortunately, you can't put it in the EML or a Department of Health guideline as an unregistered product, which means that if they do put it on there, then there's a legislative requirement for them to provide it. So unfortunately, the access to it at this point is through either a section 21 and i think you'll hear from the western cape that they they can afford it but i think the majority of provinces can't afford extensive access to this outside of the access program so i think we, we we're waiting for SAPA approval and that really is you know once it's registered we can go through that route but until it's registered we stuck with this sort of in-between area where we where, where you're relying on a donation and to make it more equitable, we need to know that the sustainability of that donation until registration occurs. And you've got some sort of distribution point or process within the province to be able to accept the donation as well as then distribute it in an equitable way. And then once I think you've got that full, the, the, the supply lines are there, then I think the implementation issues are very easy. Guidelines are available, training is easy. 
But once you've got stock interruptions and stock problems, then people lose faith in that. And there's back and forth between where you've got fluconazole, flucytosine, and then the uptake isn't as good. So I think the key issue is a key pipeline in terms of your stock. And then from there, a good training and, uh, and implementation process with good evaluation of, of, of stock levels and clinical outcomes. So I think I, I think I can leave it there and hand it over to Peter. Great, thanks, John. Peter? Your experiences in Limpopo. Okay. Uh, good morning to the panel and uh, all the audience. So our experience is uh, maybe the opposite of uh, what John has experienced uh, in the Eastern Cape. So I'm also in a predominantly rural province uh, in Limpopo, and uh, uh, what we found is uh, we've been using head access uh, only in the tertiary uh, hospital for just over two years uh, after being invited to uh, take part in the um, MSF uh, access program. So in the first month or two, there was uh, enthusiasm for using flucytosine because most people understood the literature and could see uh, the benefit of giving it oral with as well as the uh, lower side effect uh, profile. But what seemed to be to hobble uh, widespread use of it was we had an internal protocol which limited its uh, indication to patients who either had pre-existing renal impairment or developed it uh, after uh, starting uh, amphotericin B. Now, the reason our protocol initially specified this uh, was there was uncertainty uh, two years ago regarding the amount of stock that we would uh, uh, have access to. And uh, so in a sense, that made people less willing to uh, use uh, flucytosine uh, as the first line uh, of therapy. And then added to that was just lack of uh, knowledge. Um, in the past few days, I've been asking uh, medical officers and consultants uh, within my department what their experience uh, with prescribing it and using it is. And funny enough, one of the first uh, uh, responses I received was from a fellow consultant who says, but do we have a free cytosine in the center? Uh, so that is a problem because it means even on ward rounds, our consultants are not uh, suggesting that uh, we use uh, the drug. Uh, similarly with pharmacy as well, um, every time I, we receive stock uh, in our institution, I get phone calls from pharmacists who don't fully understand why we have access to flucytosine and what the indication is. And one has to start from scratch explaining to a different pharmacist uh, the uh, conditions under which the drug has been received and its indication and the like. So there seems to be a, a lack of uh, diffusion of knowledge uh, within our center, which is uh, a great uh, concern, uh, which would pr should prompt uh, us to have a, a better training and uh, awareness uh, uh, program uh, within this facility, but also now that we're looking to expand uh, across the province uh, to, to and encompass other individuals uh, around the province. And then lastly, one of the other surprising responses I received was uh, one doctor told me they were somewhat discouraged by the Section 21 uh, process. Uh, they found the form too long and they uh, related an experience of having the form uh, being returned from pharmacy due to one or other um, errors in completion. And once again, that just makes people less reluctant uh, to consider it for its uh, use. Um, so on reflection, clearly these are uh, problems that are easily surmountable. Uh, and so um, the way forward really for us is uh, to engage with people uh, a lot more, uh, maybe in the form of lectures, but also to, to visit people in their wards, join them on their ward runs, and maybe proactively uh, look for crypto cases and uh, have a little chat with the treating team just to ensure uh, that people understand that the drug is now available in greater quantities, uh, potentially with a greater security of, uh, of supply. And I think the benefits are, are, are quite obvious, uh, and I don't think we should have a challenge uh, uh, convincing people uh, of, uh, of, of, of its benefits. Uh, thanks. Great, thanks. Peter, does that mean that besides the tertiary facility that you're working in, it's not available anywhere else in Limpopo, right? Uh, 
Uh, up, up until now, that's correct. So deliveries were only limited to uh, Petersburg Hospital in Polokwane as the tertiary facility for uh, the province. I will add, however, that once or twice I have received calls from uh, doctors at uh, our feeder hospitals who would uh, have a crisis where they have a patient who might be intolerant to amphotericin B or may have uh, unresolved renal uh, dysfunction and they are concerned. And at least in those cases, we've been able to uh, courier the drug to, to those facilities upon receipt of the Section 21. Uh, I have been in discussions with the team at uh, Chai, and uh, since the last month, we decided to roll out the program to uh, the remaining district, uh, regional hospitals rather uh, within the province. So within a few weeks, we expect uh, at least six other hospitals in Limpopo will be able to uh, receive stock and start uh, uh, providing it to their cryptococcal patients. Great. Thanks for the additional information as well, Peter. Um, Eunice, you already started uh, explaining some of your experiences. Uh, any further experiences from KZN, uh, Eunice? Yeah, you know, when, when MSF first approached us, I think this was in 19, sorry, 19, 2018, quote, I'm going back, back into the past. And in 2018, with this idea, and it, it was a very sensible idea that they came with. You know, they said that the pharmaceutical companies are, are happy to expand the uh, availability of the drug, and they're happy to reduce the price of the drug, but obviously economy of scales is what will drive the price down. So we have to demonstrate that there is a need for the drug and there will be increased use of the drug. And as a result of that, prices will come down. However, they were not prepared to register until there was increased use of the drug. And the, the utilization of the drug would not go up until the price comes down. So it was a circular problem. So what Chai and, 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 and MS have decided is that they will acquire the drug, create a need for the drug, and then demonstrate to the company that, yes, you can increase your production 10, 24, drive the price down, and now it will then be taken over by the National Department of Health for use of cryptococcal meningitis. And introducing 5 flu cytosine into the therapeutic armamentarium was a no-brainer. I mean, it had huge advantages, decreases hospital stay, uncomplicates the treatment, reduce monitoring, getting out of hospital sooner, less toxicity, decreased mortality. So when they came to us with this idea, we were very excited by it because we realized that this was something that we would need to use. But the problem is it came to us in the form of us appealing to the Department of Health to consider allowing us to use the drug at our sites. And we are clinicians working in the cold face. You know, we really don't know the workings of the Department of Health beyond the confines of our hospital. So it was a huge learning experience on who we should go to and what we should give them so that they can consider using the drug. And when I first started, in my mind, this was pretty straightforward. I mean, we're giving somebody something for free, asking them to allow us to use it for free that will save them money. So in my mind, I could not imagine that there would be any reason not to allow it. However, we were surprised because the responses that we got back from the provincial department of health was, you know, are you trying to do research with the drug and why is this drug not available to all sites equitably? Why are you choosing particular sites to use the drug? And I, I think they might not have realized that this was sort of a gradual introduction and a controlled introduction so that we can get people accustomed to using the drug, get familiar with using the drug, and then drive the use of the drug initially at few sites and then expand beyond. And then subsequently, so in KwaZulu-Natal, we were actually the last to engage the process. All the other provinces had already started using the drug. And unfortunately, I think it was either MSF or CHAI managed to do two important things, is get the National Department of Health to approve the use of the drug number one, and to get a national uh, approval from SAPRA to use it as a Section 21 drug, which reduced the amount of work that we had to do in our local sites. Since then, we've engaged, re-engaged the Department of Health, and they seem to understand what we have in mind and have given approval to use the drugs at all of these areas. The second problem was convincing people at the, at the various sites to start using the drug. And the problem really wasn't convincing them to use it because of the benefits from the drug, but it was an SOP that applied in some cases and not in others, very similar to what was in Limpopo. 
So in other words, there were specific indications and we put down those indications because we were concerned about supply chain. If we had opened it out so that all patients would get 5 flu cytosine for cryptococcal meningitis, we might very well run out of drug. So we had to use it in a selective manner. And the problem with using it in a selective manner is that people have short memories, they forget about the drug and they don't use it. So those were the few challenges that we experienced. And then what I've got to realize is that when a drug is first introduced into the market, it's usually done by a pharmaceutical company who's got a vested interest and in making a lot of profit out of the drug. So very often we as clinicians are only engaged as part of CMEs to talk about clinical experience, but all the logistics and the, um, the admin and the governance that goes behind making drugs available, convincing departments of health to use the drug, in making sure supply chains are maintained, are all taken care of by the pharmaceutical company. And here, we as clinicians on the ground who have got many other things keeping us busy, needed to get that in order. And that was a huge challenge, finding time, understanding the processes, and trying to do that. It has been difficult, but I think that uh, the benefits to the patient are huge. And I think we are finally reaching a point where we can start using it initially at selected sites, but hopefully expand it beyond. So I'd like to thank Chai as well as MSF and DNDI for persisting and assisting us in trying to get this through. I'll stop here and take any questions as we come along. Thanks, Stephen. Great. Thanks very much, Yunusan. Clearly, uh, you know, when you have anything that's uh, uh, constrained by supply, you're going to have constrained use as well. So fairly, fairly clear. Thanks very much, Yunus. So let's move on to then uh, experiences from the Western Cape, and I'll hand over to Jackie. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, I must say um, our experience was uh, it doesn't seem it's not as easy as it seemed. It also took uh, quite a while. Uh, we started the process in 2018, um, and our first stop was at the Provincial Pharmaceuticals and uh, Therapeutics Committee. Um, but there's also a time delay because they only meet every quarter. Um, but luckily for us, the, the evidence was sufficient for them to support our submission. And the one condition was that we had to make it available um, throughout the province so that all patients can benefit from, from the cytosine. Um, then um, uh, our next step was to, we included costing and uh, some forecasting because we, had, we could, uh, um, from NHLS data, understand what kind of burden we were looking at and, and how much uh, we, would, what we would need to procure. Um, after that was uh, getting in touch with the company and getting information for our uh, Section 21 application. And that also took some time. Um, uh, and we decided to do a bulk Section 21 application for the province uh, to lift the burden off the facilities. Because as uh, previous speakers mentioned, it's quite a um, tedious to do individual Section 21 applications. Um, our application was approved within one day by SAPRA, so we were very fortunate. Um, but there, there's other internal uh, supply chain processes that, that we had to go through. So our stock only arrived uh, in May. So from January after the Section 21 was approved, our stock only arrived in May, and uh, we only properly kicked off in June. Um, we decided to, to keep the stock at the depot as a line item so that everyone had access to it and could order it uh, through the normal um, uh, order procedures in the province. Um, and uh, I think there were different areas where we could have improved. For example, training. Um, we included the cytosine training in our bigger HIV guideline uh, training when Dolly Tegeva was in, uh, introduced. Um, and in hindsight, clearly we had the wrong um, audience for the flu uh, session. Um, and talking to different hospitals, you know, it became apparent that most of the teaching happened around the, the bedside uh, and doing ward rounds. And that is where, um, where you know, where, where people were mostly trained about flu uh, and the new treatment regimens. Um, but some hospitals did not have ID specialists, um, uh, some ward rounds did, uh, did not include specialists, and a lot of the queries landed up with a pharmacy, the hospital pharmacy staff, who then also was not properly, did not receive proper training. Um, so from our order patterns, we could see like after a year, after 12 months, things settled, which means that it's more or less how long it took for 
you know, for the new guidelines to, to filter through. So even despite um, the code, the medicine being coded and it being channeled through all the hospital and district PPCs, all our tools being updated, tech being updated, um, it still didn't necessarily reach the people on the ground. And I think this is what led to the slow implementation during the first year. Um, yeah, so that, that is our experience. So we've been, we've been seeing a, a stable, um, stable demand for it. Um, luckily for us, we didn't have to venture on the second Section 21 application because we could also join the, the access program. So we are also very um, um, uh, grateful to Chai for that opportunity. Thanks, thanks, Jackie. Jackie, how many patients do you guys have, and what's the forecast like in the Western Cape? So that we have an idea, you know, on yeah, what you're looking at. We're looking at about 500 to 600 patients a year. So that's about 40, 40 a month that we treat. Um, and some small hospitals see two or three patients a month. And so I'm not quite sure how that compares with other provinces, but, but that's our burden. Great. And it seems both from uh, Peto and uh, Jackie, your presentation, um, that training of clinicians and training of pharmacists are quite critical to the introduction of uh, new regimens, new drugs. Um, and would you recommend a bulk section 21 to other provinces? And uh, can you say a little bit about how you went about doing it? Because I'm quite surprised that SEPA took one day to give you approval because that's not most people's experiences, unfortunately, of SEPRA's turnaround time. Mm. Over to you, Jack. Um, yeah, that was the first time I did a section, about Section 21 application. It was early in January, so it must have been very quiet. Um, and it was on their new electronic uh, submission system. Um, so I, um, it became increasingly difficult as the access program started to, uh, you know, start, started to develop because I think uh, India H wanted one stream of um, of access to to cytosine. So I think um, we were fortunate enough to, to have a successful section twenty bulk section twenty one application um, early in twenty nineteen before the access program started. Um, I, um, We've got quite a good structure supporting health health programs in the province. Um, and it includes ID specialists from the uh, academic institutions, different hospitals and other clinicians. So I think uh, we had buying from the start. Um, and uh, you know our existing system of, of provincial memos and circulars, uh, people are used to that kind of uh, way of conveying changes, changes in policies and, and treatment regimens. I think we had some kind of a foundation, but as I said, it was also had its its faults that uh, it didn't always filter through, and I think there was major gaps in the training. Great, thanks. I don't know, Graham Menkes, uh, do you want to come in as a clinician in the Western Cape? Because we've heard from Jackie working at the provincial level. Uh, any views, experiences from you, or Graham? Yeah, I, you know, I think the, the, the um, advantage in the Western Cape is it was um, managed centrally and, you know, taken through the directorate. Uh, and then, you know, the access was done centrally and with, with that key underpinning principle that Jackie referred to, that if there was going to be access, it had to be fair and available to all across the province. And then, you know, so the, the access issue was sorted out and then, uh, you know, the circular came out um, and, and um, Clearly, you know, the, the, it does take time to, to translate from a circular to knowledge within the ward context. Um, but, you know, at least that, that circular is, is taken up by pharmacists who can then advise clinicians. Um, so I think, you know, as opposed to having uh, sort of um, piecemeal and limited access and um, at, 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 at having, you know, a, a broad access with a policy uh, framework uh, certainly, uh, you, you know, made it made it easier to implement, and um, you know, and then, and then as, as Jackie said, you know, informal networks of uh, you know clinicians phoning uh, if if they were using it for the first time at their hospital, if they had issues phoning uh, other clinicians that had had um, experience and 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 getting advice um, meant that you know it took a, a few months to implement, but now I think. Um, 
you know, as, as, as John had said, once, once it's in place and, and the protocols are there, people are comfortable to use it. It's not particularly complicated. Great, thanks. We'll go back uh, for last comments from the panelists before we close. Um, so Eunice, can we ask you to make your last comment and also to tell us whether or not you've been educating pa uh, patients and, and you know, the HIV community in KZN, Eunice, over. Yeah, I, well, I actually had a question that I wanted to ask. You know, when we were approached by Chai as well as uh, MSF to try and make this drug available in the province, I was just wondering whether we were the right people to have been approached. Should the, should the pharmaceutical services, this is a drug that needs to be made available. I mean, and, and clinicians certainly have a, have a role in, 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 in rolling out the drug, but the primary individual that should have been liaising with the pharmaceutical services within the province and within the authorities that give you authorization to use the drug, would the people engaging them not have been the pharmaceutical people, the pharmacists themselves that are involved? So I just wanted to know whether the experience at, in Cape province would help us decide how best we should have done it. That's number one. Number two is that in terms of patient education, we haven't rolled out in mass patient education, but however, we depend on the clinician that is seeing a patient to educate that particular patient about the drugs that are available, the drugs we are planning to use, their toxicities and the duration of treatment so that the patient walks out realizing that instead of getting an IV formulation, he's getting an oral formulation and the efficacy of the oral formulation. So we've depended on the clinicians to drive the patient education rather than we need an en masse the way we do for HIV or for tuberculosis. And remember, there is a, a large number of patients, but a small proportion of HIV positive patients get cryptococcal meningitis. So it makes sense to do it on a one on one basis with patients that do have the disease. I'll, I'll Great. stop there. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Judith. Uh, Peto, any last comments uh, from you? Um, no, I think overall it's good to hear different people's um, experiences. And, you know, one can contrast. Uh, John's uh, experience with a clinician-led rollout uh, with the Western Cape's more um, provincial office-led uh, rollout. Uh, and it's interesting that they've both had successes with uh, the different uh, approaches. So I think uh, our rollout will also have to uh, take into account the context of our province and uh, what generally works uh, well for us. And um, I think uh, we'll learn a lot from Jackie's um, point that we need to drive teaching from ward rounds because CMEs are great. You know, people sit, uh, they, they feel that, that their heads have been filled with new information, uh, but we also need to engage people at the, the, the front line itself uh, because old habits do die hard. And I think that's been one of, that, that's for me, that's been our biggest um, a failure is, uh, as much as people used a lot of fusitis in the first month or two, after a while, for whatever reason, muscle memory went back to prescribing uh, amphotericin B. But overall, we're excited to have uh, access to it. And I think we need to do better in terms of um, yeah, actually using uh, a resource uh, when we had it, when we have it. And uh, for that reason, I'm, we're thankful to Chai and uh, DNDI uh, for their efforts to improve uh, our patients' uh, outcomes. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Nilesh has just posted that, uh, at least from the lab diagnosis, there are about 100 cases of, of uh, cryptococcus uh, and meningitis uh, per week in South Africa. And if you, you know, if you look at the mortality rate of between 40 and 60 percent, and uh, according to Nilesh, uh, we, are, we only have about 6 percent of our crypto patients on, on this regime. So, you know, we have a long way to go. Uh, let me hand over to John for your comments. John, your last comments. Over. Uh, thanks, Evan. So, uh, I think just to reflect again, the Western Cape experience, I think, is partly, I think, to realize that the provinces all have very different financial capabilities and the fiscus and control of them are very different. And I think you're unlikely to see provinces outside of the Western Cape being able to actually purchase fusitazine unless it's a lot more affordable. Um, as a section 21, which, you know, and that's in, in keeping with the, the national EML legislative issues. I don't think they want to take on that particular financial burden because that's going to create a lot of legal liability and other things. So that means a lot of the pressure has to come on the company to register the product and go through that process 
So it can then be put on the EML and then we can access it more broadly. I think the reason that the clinicians are rolling it out in this way is because the provinces and the authorities actually can't um, commit to purchasing these, these items. And that means that this access program needs to fill the gap until such time as, as SAPRA gets the, you know, you can't force the company to register, but I think the advocacy should be to try and get them to register. And I think SAPRA would then, with all the pressure on them, would look at registering the product fairly, in, in a fairly rapid manner, and then we could take it through from there. So, you know, that's, that, that, that would be a way through. And, and then I think equitable access would be far more, far, far easier to, to achieve. As it currently stands, to create more equitable access with an access program like this is difficult. It requires a good pharmacist, it requires a lot of communications in the province. But I do think it should be pushed because I think all patients with putrecocal meningitis should have access to this. So maybe it's just to say that those who do have access and those who want access, they need to communicate and try within the provinces to work out ways of, of distributing it and getting it to people who need it. Thanks. John, while, you, while you have the floor, there was a question about under 18s. Uh, can you uh, initiate a treatment with the 5FC with under 18s? Over. As far as I know, you can, yeah. I, I was going to be corrected. I don't see too many under 18s, but as far as I know, they, they, they can access treatment without a problem. I see Graham and treatment. Eunice nodding in the affirmative. So I think that's. So with respect to registration, the uh, company has uh, sent a dossier to uh, SAPRA and MSF and Nilesh Governor have sent letters independently to SAPRA urging them to speed up the process of registration. Chai is doing uh, something quite similar to get them to register um, and as well as trying to work on reducing the cost but as I think many have said on the call that the cost will decrease as uh, quantities increase. Um, Back to you, Jackie. Any final thoughts uh, on what you think would work in other provinces that worked for you? <laughs> Noting the differences that John yeah. mentioned. Yeah, no, I think John summarized it very well. Um, I think something that shouldn't stop is the advocacy at, at all levels about getting, uh, getting access uh, to the cyclosine. Um, and then in provinces, perhaps find that central person or provincial lead who will be able to facilitate or help you expand the access program in the province. Great, thanks. I think we need to draw this to a conclusion so that uh, Graham can get going uh, with uh, the ambition study. But let me say a few things. So one is that it's clear that uh, 5FC is being used, should be used, is a good product to use. Uh, there are challenges at uh, both facility level, provincial level, and of course at national level that we need to tackle. Uh, but it's fairly clear that there's appetite from the clinicians to do it. Uh, there's a good good experiences in I think many facilities and of course at the provincial level in the Western Cape that we can uh, learn from. May I suggest that in order to not put pressure on SAPRA, but uh, let SAPRA know that there's a certain sense of urgency around 5FC that people on the call led by the panelists write to SAPRA, that we collectively write to SAPRA, urging them to fast track the registration. Uh, and then we'll do the same with the, uh, the levers within the Department of Health. So I can see people nodding at that suggestion. So we will draft something and send it to the presenters. And if there are others, the participants on the call that would like to sign up to it, please indicate on the chat that you'd like to sign up as well and that we will then collectively send a letter to Helen and to me uh, to speed up the process of registration, which will take the burden away from the Section 21s at the individual clinical level. So thank you very much for participating. And uh, I, I really, um, uh, really an enthusiastic supporter of IFC as well. Uh, and we will certainly from Chai do everything we can to get the registration going, et cetera. Uh, so with that, let me hand over. Graham, am I handing over to you? Uh, that's fine, go ahead. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Jürgen. Um, so um, I'm Graham Ankus, I'm an infectious diseases physician at the University of Cape Town, and I'm going to be chairing uh, the next 45 minutes of the webinar. And um, the, this uh, portion of the webinar is uh, focused on the Ambition CM trial, 
um, that is really a landmark trial within cryptococcal meningitis uh, with exciting findings that, that will have implications for, for patient care and clinical gui uh, guidelines internationally. Uh, the findings were recently presented at the International AIDS Conference. Uh, and just important to highlight, this is the, the largest trial that's ever been done in cryptococcal meningitis. It was a multi-center trial involving sites in Uganda, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Botswana, uh, and our site in, in Cape Town. Um, the, the, uh, we're going to have uh, five talks um, in the session, and that will be followed by a, a panel discussion, um, and that will be over the next 45 minutes, as I said. Uh, please, if you have questions as we go along, uh, we're going to save them for the panel discussion section, but please type them in and we can address those uh, in the panel discussion. Um, and, you know, before we get going, I just wanted to say a big thank you to all colleagues at, at the NDI and, and CHI uh, for the organisation of this very important webinar today. So our first speaker is uh, Joe Jarvis. Uh, Joe is uh, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, has been based in Gaborone and uh, for the last number of years and was the PI and the, really the lead um, and conceived uh, the ambition trial. Uh, and Joe is going to present uh, the high, highlight, the headline findings of, of the trial. So Joe, are you um, able to share your slides? Yeah, thanks very much, Graham. And thank you very much for inviting me to talk on the ambition study. Let me just share my slides. Um, yeah, we're seeing that. That's in full screen. Thanks, Joe. Great. So hopefully you can see the slides. Yeah. Great. Good. So um, I'm presenting today on behalf of a very large consortium of investigators um, whose hard work over the last five years in particularly challenging circumstances have made this all possible and there are too many people to thank individually but I should mention a few people um, who are here with us today especially the UCT team with Sipa Kazi, Kyler and Graham um, and David Lawrence who is the lead uh, clinician on the trial who's going to be joining the panel discussion and also thank the trial participants and the funders who are the EDCTP, Wellcome Trust, UK MRC and UK Overseas Development Assistance uh, and Gilead who provided the, uh, the study drug. Sorry, just trying to present the slide. So I think I can skip over the, uh, the introduction here. I don't think we really need to, to go through that again. Suffice to say, cryptococcal meningitis remains the leading cause of adult meningitis in most of Southern and East Africa. And mortality remains extremely high. And a key reason for the poor treatment outcomes we see is the fact that we're trying to give long intravenous courses of amphotericin B deoxycholate, a drug that's extremely difficult to administer safely and can cause significant side effects in very resource constrained, constrained healthcare settings. Um, standard courses of amphotericin B deoxycholate are associated with severe thrombophobitis, nosocomial sepsis in up to 15% of patients, infusion reactions, anemia. Um, renal impairment and potassium and magnesium wasting. So there's an urgent need to define safer treatments that are appropriate for the resource settings. One potential option is to give shorter courses of amphotericin B deoxycholate. Um, and we've already heard about the ACTA trial, uh, which looked at abbreviated seven day amphotericin B deoxycholate courses uh, in, in a clinical trial and showed that this could be safely given and that one week courses of amphotericin B deoxycholate when given with flucytosine actually led to lower mortality than conventional two week courses, probably due to shorter treatments having equivalent fungicidal activity while avoiding the side effects associated with 14 day treatment courses. But what about liposomal amphotericin B? We know that it's less nephrotoxic, meaning that higher doses can be given safely. It's got excellent tissue penetration and a long tissue half-life, meaning that we should be able to deliver highly effective induction therapy with very short courses. And effective long-lasting therapy with just a single high dose of liposomal amphotericin B has been established in the treatment of another disease, visceral leishmaniasis. In cryptococcal meningitis, its use was previously limited by cost, but if we could shorten the courses and 
get reduced or preferential pricing, this may be a cost effective option. So there was a need to define the most effective and the most cost effective schedules of amphotericin B deoxycholate. We initially performed a phase two study using early fungicidal activity or rate of clearance of cryptococcus from the CSF as our primary endpoint, comparing a single 10 milligram per kilogram dose given on day one uh, with fluconazole for 14 days to the standard three mg per kg given for 14 days. And also we had a two dose arm with a single 10 mg per kg dose at day one and five mg per kg at day three or three doses, 10 mg per kg day one five mg per kg day three and day seven. And what this trial showed was that the early fungicidal activity or the rate of clearance in, of infection was actually as good as, or in fact, slightly faster with the single dose as it was compared to control. So in terms of our primary outcome in what was another non-inferiority trial, um, the panel on the right shows the point estimate for the difference in rate of clearance between one dose, two dose, and three doses of the high dose formulation of liposomal amphotericin compared to the control formulation. And first of all, you can see that all three short course high dose regimens were non inferior in terms of rate of appearance uh, to the standard 14 day dosing of liposomal amphotericin B. You can see that, in fact, in all cases, the point estimates suggest that there's slightly faster clearance, if anything, with the high dose regimens compared to standard amphotericin B-deoxycholate over 14 days. And you can also see that there's no suggestion of a dose response in that max maximal fungicidal activity appeared to be obtained with that single 10 milligram per kilogram dose with no additional benefit of adding a further one or two doses to that. So on the basis of those findings, uh, we sought to evaluate whether this single 10 milligram per kilogram dose of liposomal amphotericin B, when given with an optimized backbone of 14 days of flucytosine plus fluconazole, was non-inferior to the current World Health Organization recommended first line regimen that had been defined in the ACTA trial. Uh, primary outcome was all-cause mortality at 10 weeks with a non-inferiority margin of 10%. And you will note that in the phase two study, we compared liposomal amphotericin B given with fluconazole, but here we're comparing it with a form of triple therapy with fluconazole and flucytosine. And we did this on the basis that in the phase two study, we'd shown that the best way to deliver ambisone was as this single high 10 milligram per kilogram dose. But since we'd finished the phase two study, the active data had come along showing that 5-FC was an essential component of treatment regimens and the best partner drug for amphotericin B-based regimens. And there was also a slight concern that if we only gave a single dose of ambisome and we gave a long course of 5-FC, we may risk 5-FC monotherapy in the second week of therapy, possibly leading to 5-FC resistance. And also I think, well, I know that we'd hope that possibly the triple therapy may be slightly better than dual therapy. And we wanted to try and define the best treatment regimen for HIV associated cryptococcal meningitis. The phase three trial is Graham mentioned was recruited, uh, recruited individuals from eight hospitals across seven cities in five countries in Southern and East Africa. And these data are fairly hot off the press. So we completed the study earlier this year, 844 participants recruited overall with the last follow-up visit in June of this year. And David Lawrence, who's on the call here, uh, presented the initial headline findings of this at the IAS conference in July. So these are these are hot off the press results. We still haven't had our publication, but hopefully that will be coming soon. Today, I'll briefly run through the highlighted outcomes. We included adults with a first episode of HIV-associated cryptococcal criteria are listed here. Late exclusion criteria were put in place to enable rapid enrollment for critically unwell participants while awaiting baseline blood results. Individuals were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio. After induction therapy, all participants received fluconazole 800 milligrams a day for eight weeks and 200 milligrams a day thereafter. ART was initiated, reinitiated, or switched four to six weeks after initiation of antifungal therapy. We screened 1,193 individuals and 844 were enrolled and randomized. After late exclusions, there were 407 participants in each arm 
who were included in the intention to treat analyses. And as a great credit to all of the study teams, we didn't lose a single participant to follow up over this entire trial at any of the sites. The two arms were well matched at baseline and represented the general population of patients presenting with cryptococcal meningitis. 60% were male, median age 37 years, and the majority were ART experienced. Uh, the proportion of participants with reduced baseline Glasgow coma score was similar as with the median baseline CSF fungal counts, which is important as these are the two main adverse prognostic indicators. And here are the primary outcome data of all cause mortality at 10 weeks. Uh, within the intention to treat analysis, there were 101 deaths in the ambosome arm, given a mortality risk of 24.8%. There were 117 deaths in the control arm, a mortality risk of 28.7%. The risk difference in the ambosome arm compared to the control arm was minus 3.9%, and the upper bound of the 90% confidence interval, which equates to a one-sided 95% confidence interval for non-inferiority, was 1.2% well below our pre-specified 10% non-inferiority margin. The results were similar in per protocol analysis as well. Uh, the upper bound of the two-sided 95% competence interval were also well below the 10% non-inferiority margin in both intention to treat and per protocol analyses. Uh, we found similar results in our adjusted analysis. Um, in the adjusted analysis, the risk difference within the intention to treat population was minus 5.71, and the upper bounds of both the 90 and 95% confidence interval were below zero at minus one and minus 0.04, respectively. These primary outcome data are visualized here in a different way. Uh, the risk difference of each analysis is shown with the two-sided 90% confidence interval across all analyses, uh, intention to treat per protocol adjusted and unadjusted. And you can see the upper bound of the confidence intervals well below the pre-specified non-inferiority margin of 10% in all cases. These are the Kaplan-Meier survival curves with the ambosome arm represented by the dashed blue line and the control arm in the solid red line. Moving on to secondary outcomes here are mortality at two, four and 16 weeks within the adjusted, uh, unadjusted intention to treat analysis. And in all instances, again, the upper bound of the 90% confidence intervals well below 10%. This was the case in the per protocol and the adjusted analyses. The early fungicidal activity rate of clearance of cryptococcus from the CSF of both arms was similar. The mean EFA was minus 0.4. Um, in the uh, ambosome arm and minus 0.42 in the control arm with no statistically significant difference between the two. And finally, the safety data for all individuals who were randomized and received any study drug. Uh, within the first 21 days of randomization, grade three or grade four events occurred more frequently in, in the control arm than the ambosome arm, as we would have expected. Grade three or four anemia was significantly less frequent in the ambosome arm, occurring in 13% of participants compared to 41% in the control arm. The mean decrease in hemoglobin over the first week was 0.3 grams per deciliter in the ambosome arm and 1.9 gram per deciliter in the control arm. 8% of participants in the ambosome arm received a blood transfusion compared to 18% in the control arm. A grade three or four increase in creatinine was relatively uncommon. Uh, developing in 5% of participants in the ambosome arm compared to 6% in the control arm. Uh, but there was a difference in the mean increase in creatinine from baseline to day seven with 20% in the ambosome arm and 49.7% in the control arm. Hypokalemia was also more common in the, uh, in the control arm. From both providers requiring antibiotic therapy occurred in 2% of ambosome participants and 7% of control participants. And there was a relatively low frequency of grade four neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, speaking to that safety uh, of flucytosine that we've discussed earlier, um, and very little elevated ALT in both arms. Um, following the, the conference presentation, this did generate quite a bit of interest and hopefully is gaining some traction. We can talk about this in the discussion a bit, but it was picked up by several of the main news feeds. MSF put out um, uh, a press release highlighting the findings and making the point that for this to be applicable, Gilead are going to have 
fulfill, fulfill their promise to scale up access to the drug and ensure that it's affordable. And Gilead themselves did put out a statement stating that they were very pleased with the findings and that they were committing to providing Ambizome at non-profit pricing for the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis in low and middle income countries. So hopefully some progress there. So in conclusion, as Graham has said, this was the largest cryptococcal meningitis trial conducted to date and has demonstrated that single high dose ambisome given with flucytosine and fluconazole was non-inferior to the current WHO recommended standard of care of seven days of standard amphotericin B plus flucytosine in averting all cause mortality at 10 weeks. Uh, the ambisome regimen effectively cleared cryptococcus from the CSF and was associated with a significant reduction in adverse events and offers a practical easier to administer and better tolerated treatment for HIV-associated cryptococcal meningitis with the potential to reduce the length of hospital admission. Um, we're currently completing a cost-effectiveness analysis of the study, uh, which we hope will provide additional evidence to support the widespread implementation of the regimen. And although we haven't finished that yet, the, I can tell you that the preliminary findings are in keeping with what we've already seen that actually using ambisome doesn't really increase the cost much over and above what we're using at the moment. Uh, and in some settings may be fairly cost neutral or even cost saving if we can reduce admission durations. And we now need to make sure that there's access to these treatments so that the, uh, the, the benefits of this regimen can be realized. So thank you very much. That's, uh, that's the end of my bit, Graham. I'll stop sharing the screen. Thanks so much, Joe, uh, for sharing those important findings with us and, and really uh, creating the context for the discussion. So we will address questions uh, in, in the panel discussion uh, section. Um, so we're going to move straight on now to hear a, a patient perspective uh, from Zekona Mbota. And, um, you know, I think uh, just to say that, you know, I think it's critical in this condition uh, to be hearing the experiences and voices of our patients and being responsive to that in terms of the treatments and the management approaches that we have. Um, and uh, Zekona provided um, consent uh, to be recorded and share her experiences with us. So that's a video record recording and I just want to ask the organizers whether they're able to play that now. hospital had a severe headaches and it was not just a normal headache because I, I was taking paracetamol I was diagnosed with cryptococcal meningitis in 2019 when I came to hospital I had a severe headaches and it was not just a normal headache because I, I was taking paracetamol and everything else that you use for headache but it was not helping then I decided to come to hospital because it was, I was at the point where I could not see with my eyes and I had a stiff neck. Then I was admitted to hospital. Only then I recognized the next day that I'm in hospital. It was so painful. I was very sick. And all I wanted was to sleep so that I can die. But you are, you are unable to sleep with such pains. The headache was very painful. I've never been in such pain in my entire life. When they started giving me treatment, I took the medication, but my problem was I was vomiting. So I wasn't sure whether the medication getting in my system properly or what, but it took me time to say that the headache has disappeared. But some days were different. I would take the medication and not feel the headache for the whole day. Then. When the headaches comes back, I will ask to, for them to do me a lumbar puncture, which they inject a little on your back. It was difficult taking the medication four times a day because sometimes they would wake you up, make a noise. Maybe if they were good, they could have given us the medication twice or once a day, it would, it would have been better. 
I was very happy to see that the medication is working. I noticed that I no longer have headache and I could widely see people around me. Yeah, then I was not vomiting anymore, so the medication was taken well by my body. It made a huge difference. Having treatment gave my life back. I can now do normal things like a normal person, and I'm so grateful for that. I don't have any fear of, of getting sick or dying at this point. We know that HIV has no cure, but it can be managed. So taking treatment is the best thing I could ever advise to anyone. Treatment can save your life. If you feel sick, go to hospital, take treatment accordingly as prescribed by the doctor, then you will be like Zikon. Thanks very much and really uplifting to see uh, Zikona relating her story and, and very grateful to her for, for doing that uh, for our webinar today. Um, so we will now go on to the next uh, section of the uh, webinar, which is to look at clinical considerations um, and then a nursing perspective. Um, and these are very brief presentations that are going to be shared by members of our ambition trial team uh, at the Cape Town site. So first, uh, I'm going to ask Kyla Commons, who worked as a, as a, uh, a doctor in the trial team uh, with at the Cape Town Ambition site to share her perspectives on clinical considerations of the findings. Kyla, are you able to share your screen? Um, yeah, I think so, Graham. Can you see my slides? Yeah, if you put it in full, full screen mode, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that's great, thanks. Great. Um, thanks, Graham, and obviously thank you also to Zikona, um, one of our very special patients. Um, so today I wanted to talk just a little bit about the clinical considerations um, when managing patients with cryptococcal meningitis. Um, I will speak um, from a, a doctor perspective, um, Sipakazi Shlungulu, one of our nursing sisters, will also talk from a nursing perspective. And um, I think it's just something that although most of us would have experienced this and would have managed patients with cryptococcal meningitis. And um, sometimes uh, you don't realize how complicated their management actually is until you see it. Like this. So just by way of background, I think we all know patients with cryptococcal meningitis are ill usually. Um, most of them present with CD4 counts lower than 100. They're not usually on effective ART. They may be ART naive or non-adherent to their regimens or failing regimens. They're obviously at high risk of other opportunistic infections or, or HIV-associated malignancies. Of course, there are exceptions to this, um, but regardless, the mortality, as we've heard, um, sits at around 40% um, by 10 weeks. So these patients are treated in hospital. And usually that's because they're sick enough to require admission to hospital, but often it's um, necessitated by the fact that they receive IV medication for at least seven, if not 14 days. They also require regular blood tests and therapeutic lumbar punctures, and their condition can change very rapidly. So it's important that they are in hospital um, with close eyes on them. Um, it's really important to clinically assess these patients for signs of raised intracranial pressure and whether or not they need um, therapeutic lumbar punctures. I'm not going to talk about this specifically because Graham is going to focus on that um, a little bit later as well. Of course, you need to look for other opportunistic um, infections, particularly TB, both pulmonary and extra pulmonary. And it's not uncommon that patients have um, dual cryptococcal and tuberculous meningitis. These patients are often confused, so they might be uncomfortable uh, with medication, especially with flucytosine being administered four times a day, um, and usually it's three to five tablets per dose. Um, that can be quite a labor-intensive exercise to get those in. They might be on nasogastric tubes and require um, pills to be crushed, crushed for administration. Um, and then once a day, they also need six tablets of fluconazole. Um, and these patients also might not be eating and drinking well. And um, as we've heard with the uh, toxicity associated with particularly amphotericin B, um, there is a risk of, of dehydration in these patients as well. So um, IV rehydration is really important. 
It's also very important, and this has been particularly challenging during COVID times, to involve the family um, early on, counsel around prognosis and make sure that everybody understands the severity of the disease. Um, in rare cases, these patients are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. The patients, for example, who have um, presented to an ARV clinic, had a diagnostic test and then a CD4 count done, and it's less than 100, and they have a reflex serum crag, which is positive, so they get an LP, and the LP is incidentally um, crag positive. So these patients now who feel quite well have to be admitted to hospital and start on treatment, and um, often that doesn't make much sense to them, so it's also really important to explain to them the severity of the condition, the need for admission to get them on board with that. And also, even in these patients, the clinical condition can deteriorate rapidly. So it's important that we don't um, naively think that they are well and will stay well. So in terms of treatment, we've heard quite a lot about the updated guidelines um, over the last couple of years. So um, the WHO's recommendation and what we use in the Western Cape and what's recommended by um, the Clinician Society is seven days of amphib with flucytosine and then seven days of high-dose fluconazole, which is 1,200 milligrams. Um, most of the rest of South Africa, as we've heard, uses 14 days of amphotericin B with fluconazole. And in the rest of Africa, as um, Sarah also mentioned earlier, Sometimes fluconazole monotherapy is all that they have access to. It might be because of inaccessibility of the amphib itself or related to the labor intensivity of administering amphib patients needing to be in hospital, uh, a four hour long IV infusion every day, pre and post hydration, et cetera. So just in terms of the treatments, amphotericin B deoxycholate, as we've talked about, is a, um, an IV infusion for seven or 14 days. The infusion must be given over four hours and 5% dextrose. And um, so that's quite labor intensive. It causes quite significant thrombophlebitis in a large proportion of the patients. And as Joe mentioned, that can lead to, to sepsis. Um, but even if not, it's very painful. The IV lines need to be recited often um, and the patients need to have pre and post hydration as well. So good IV access is really important. Um, and the drug is nephrotoxic, causes electrolyte wasting. So you need to um, supplement the electrolytes, particularly potassium and magnesium as well, while on amphotericin B. It also causes bone marrow suppression and most particularly anemia. And um, this does seem to be time dependent and usually occur later on in treatment. So the reduction in treatment to seven days as opposed to 14 um, does help um, and reduce the risk of, of severe anemia and the need for transfusion, um, but it doesn't eliminate the risk. The liposomal formulation, as we've heard, um, can be given with a single dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram um, from the ambition trial. And it's less toxic than the deoxycholate formulation for the kidneys, bone marrow, and the veins, and obviously only needing to be given once, um, even if it does result in some thrombophlebitis, um, you don't need to recite the line. Fluconazole, uh, I think we're all very familiar with, and it's generally quite well tolerated. The high dose is six tablets um, or capsules every day of the 200 milligram formulation. There was a time last year um, where at Kailicha Hospital, we only had the 50 milligram formulation. So those patients were receiving huge numbers of tablets, um, but generally it's the 200 milligrams that are available. It can be hepatotoxic, but it's not very common. And Usually these patients are also on um, Bactrim. They might also be on TB treatment or INH prophylaxis. So if these patients do develop a drug-induced liver injury, it's more likely one of the other drugs that's causing it, and those should be stopped first. Um, and, and fluconazole continued as far as clinically possible. Fluconazole monotherapy can result in resistance, and so it's definitely not preferred. And um, because it's metabolized by the kidneys, the dose needs to be adjusted in renal impairment, which, as we know, is quite common, particularly in these patients who are also receiving amphotericin. And then 5-FC, as we've talked about as well, is a weight-based dosing um, schedule, so the, the number of tablets varies by patient, but it's usually quite a lot of tablets over the course of 24 hours. The six-hourly dosing is challenging. 
the 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. doses, which um, are often, um, well, they, they're over a night shift in the hospital. So sometimes there's issues with um, nursing staff who aren't familiar with the drug or who maybe preferentially work nights and haven't been around in training sessions during the day. Um, patients are often asleep. Um, so if patients go home while still on flucytosine, um, then they often forget these doses. It can cause quite severe nausea, and obviously the meningitis itself and the raised intracranial pressure do that too. Um, so it's sometimes a bit difficult to, to tease out which it is. But we found um, that really only on Dantatron works. Um, Mixclopramide and Stemethyl don't do very much, but of course, if that's all you have, it's still better than nothing. And it also does cause bone marrow toxicity, but as we heard earlier as well, it's much uh, less common than um, kind of in theory reported, uh, particularly if it's only given for seven days, often you do a, an FBC at baseline and another one on day seven, and by the time you see the neutropenia or thrombocytopenia, the drug is stopped anyway. But it can sometimes necessitate those adjust adjustments um, if it's really severe. And again, it's uh, metabolized by the kidneys. So in patients with renal impairment, it needs to be dose adjusted. An important thing to also remember is the other medications that these patients are likely to be on. So um, most of them would be on Bactrim. Some might be on TB treatment or INH prophylaxis. The other thing is, um, and of particular significance, is the antiretroviral therapy. Um, of course, if a patient's ART naive at presentation, that's pretty straightforward. You just delay the initiation of their ART for four to six weeks to minimize the risk of cryptococcal meningitis iris. But if they are on treatment, then basically it becomes a little bit tricky. Uh, if the patient is reportedly adherent, um, it's... So if the patient obviously tells you they haven't taken their tablets for more than a month, well, then obviously they're not adherent, they're not suppressed, and you delay their ART. But if the patient reports being adherent, it's important to do a viral load and assess whether the patient is in fact biologically suppressed, because there are two possibilities. One is that they are actually non-adherent, and then providing ART in hospital, under hospital administering conditions, um, you're basically reinitiating ART and the, the risk of, um, of iris is very high. And then the other possibility is treatment failure if the viral load is high, in which case those patients are not going to benefit from ongoing ART anyway. So um, it might as well be stopped. So it's only in a really small proportion of patients who are on ART and virologically suppressed who you would continue ART for um, on admission with cryptococcal meningitis. There was previously a recommendation to switch patients onto no fever-based regimens due to the risk of renal impairment, but with the shorter courses of amphotericin B, that's not necessary. Um, if patients are on effective TDF-based ART, then we can continue. But as I say, it's really the minority of patients who are actually on effective ART at the point of diagnosis with cryptococcal meningitis. And in most situations, we should avoid steroids. There are some rare exceptions, and of course, patients with concomitant TB meningitis present particular challenges in that. That respect. I mean, it's really important to consider the other non pharmacological um, treatments as well. As I said, Graham will talk about raised intracranial pressure management with therapeutic lumbar puncture, but it's also really important to involve all your allied health. These patients are often um, bedridden for at least a proportion of their hospital admission. They need physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Sometimes they have particular encephalopathies that result in nerve palsies. Um, stroke, and they actually need specific rehab and physiotherapy for those things. Speech therapy is really important. We usually get the dietitians involved as well, um, and often a social worker or some kind of social intervention is also needed because um, of the circumstances to which these patients get discharged. And then there are some other important things that need to be assessed, sometimes during the acute admission, but also later on during follow-up, like visual acuity, which is often impaired um, hearing testing, and also additional cognitive assessments. A lot of the patients actually have mild cognitive fallout following the meningitis, which might not be appreciable by the clinician, but if you speak to their families, they report that the patient isn't quite what they were before. And so it's important to get an idea of what that is and involve occupational therapists if necessary. 
And then just in terms of monitoring, of course, you're going to tailor this to the regimen that the patient's on, but it's really important to just get some baseline um, values for the ALT, uh, for blood count, um, a urea and creatinine, which in our context includes the potassium, but not the magnesium. So you need to add the magnesium. And then monitor these regularly while the patient is on treatment. If they're on amphotericin B, we should be doing a UNE every um, two to three days. If they're on um, flucytosine, we should do an FBC after a week. And the same with patients on Ampho B. And we should routinely supplement potassium and magnesium. If patients' renal impairment, um, or if patients develop renal impairment, then we should um, increase fluid rehydration, increase potassium and magnesium supplementation if necessary, and remember to adjust the fluconazole and flucytosine doses. And obviously consider transfusion in patients whose HP drops below eight, which is usually more common in patients on a two-week amphotericin B regimen. 5-FC, as mentioned, can cause um, thrombocytopenia or neutropenia. Um, it's usually not necessary to dose adjust. The only challenge is if the patients are requiring therapeutic lumbar puncture, that lumbar punctures are contraindicated with thrombocytopenia. So it's important then to balance the need for antifungals with um, the need for therapeutic lumbar puncture. Once the patients are discharged, um, it's important to continue with follow-up. Um, they need to be in hospital, obviously, for the duration of their IV medications, but after the seven days or 14 days of amphotericin B, they can be discharged home. Um, and obviously, you want to try and discharge patients early in order to re um, reduce the risks associated with prolonged hospital admissions, but also balance the benefit of being in hospital and um, the, um, the ability to continue with therapeutic lumbar puncture. So... Um, you need to review the patient at least on day 14, if they've already gone home before that, to switch their fluconazole dose from 1,200 milligrams per day to 800 milligrams per day. And then you also need to see them at about four to six weeks to initiate or switch or restart ART. You need to see them again at week 10 to dose adjust the fluconazole again down to the prophylactic dose of 200. And then obviously your routine antiretroviral care. Um, beyond that um, with, with fluconazole for at least a year. So obviously that doesn't all have to happen at hospital level outpatients, um, but the, the follow-up regimen needs to be specified clearly so that these patients aren't lost um, to follow up. So just in summary, these patients are really complex and they're ill and they often have comorbidities um, and are at high risk for mortality. Um, and even though that then necessitates urgent treatment, the treatment is also toxic and challenging to administer. So um, just to be aware of the fact that guidelines do differ by region and availability, hopefully very soon, flu cytosine will be widely available and the um, shorter uh, flu um, amphotericin and B course can be widely implemented. But regardless of what the first 14 days look like, the treatment remains the same beyond that for all patients. It's important, obviously, to manage the HIV appropriately and to involve the allied health services and patients' relatives um, early on in terms of um, improving the prognosis for these patients after discharge. So as uh, mentioned, you're welcome to add any questions into the chat box. We'll take those during our panel discussion a little bit later. Um, but Graham's going to speak now a little bit more into the detail of the need for therapeutic lumbar punctures. Thanks very much, Kyla, for that comprehensive overview. I wonder if, uh, in the interest of time, we could just go directly to Sipokazi, um, okay. and, uh, and then we'll see if there's time for the discussion of the, the lumbar puncture. So just to introduce Sipokazi, uh, Sipokazi Shungula is the, was the um, study coordinator for the ambition trial. Um, at our site in Cape Town and is a nursing sister and is going to speak to the nursing perspectives uh, on the management of cryptococcal meningitis. So over to you, Sipokazi. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, uh, Prof says, my name is Pukaz. I'm a registered nurse and I was a study coordinator uh, for ambition trials. Um, Dr. Kyla, I would wait for you for the slides. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be talking more about the nursing care of the patient with cryptococcal meningitis. As you all heard, that these patients are very sick and they really need like like proper like attention, especially from the nurses. 
because as they come in, they will be diagnosed with cryptic meningitis and they will be, the, the, the treatment will be prescribed, which is called the IVs that is ample. And that is going to be arm for obvious this 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 kcl that needs to be given prior giving the arm for the, the patient and they're all also going to be on oral meds also these patients they come in like very confused some some of the patients they come in very confused and um even with their swallowing we would need to to insert the ngt in ngt tubes and because they are some of them they are like very unconscious would need to be they will need to be on the nephews and would need they will need also like special cares because they, some some of them they couldn't tell themselves they come in like confused like i said so they are there you need to be like give them like a close monitoring because as you put on like the the, 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 the ivs the patient will pull up the drip because like they are confused so yes um also when you are taking care of a patient with cryptococcal man meningitis as dr Kyla was saying there's high mortality so it's also emotional challenging because one day you are here the patient is looking much better and then when you come the next day the patient is die so yes we also take we need to take that into consideration um also, the signs to look for when you are nursing the patient with protocol meningitis, because with them, it's still gonna, only going to be the situation of giving the medication as prescribed by the doctor. You need to also look for the signs of raising canal pressure, because one minute the patients are well, like I said, and this patient, the next minute this patient would need like an like a LP, like just now. So you need to be like monitoring them as you are giving the medication. Look for your severe headaches, like. The patient they will have maybe seizures sometimes and then they are confused and that's severe nausea and vomiting and dr kala said we were lucky in our trial to have authenticity because sometimes they the, the marks alone in the cemetery they don't like work as like as, as quickly as one would like but then we, we had help of authenticity on that time yes with the medication um the patient will be on IVs and then you need to 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 give case the case L prior giving the arm for this patient. So it's good seven days. And as I said, the patients are confused. So they 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 they, they you would need to insert the trip. Um to insert the trip maybe even twice like a, in, in, in one day or every day. Because after giving the arm, for, giving the case L is going to be arm for, and then after the arm for, you, you would you would you, you would you would give a flush, which is nevertheless. But then arm for also causes phlebitis, so that is why you need to 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 to, to also observe the lines, if because you, you might change them like as frequently. Yes, and with these patients, sometimes as we are giving the arm for, that is why they also, like, they, they, it's true that they need, like, close monitoring. As we are giving the arm, patient might develop bridges. So also what helps is to, is, to, is to decrease the rate of you giving the arm for. And also the two panadols you would give when you would give, when you are giving the, the arm for. So also that helps. Um, with the medication, there's also fluconazole, Sometimes this, it's always like this, there will be back cream that you would give. So if you if if you, if, you, if you look at the pill button and the, and the patient is unable to 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 swallow as NGT, so you must crush all of that medication and give via the NGT. So yes, in giving the in giving the fluoxetine, what we did was the staff training, like prior, like 
coming even to hospitals, it has a bit of like challenging because the shifts are changing in hospitals. One minute we are training this shift and the other minute we are training the other shift. Also, what was the challenge with flu cytosine? Because it's given to ID, in most cases at night, it's like agent staff whom are not trained because we don't, we didn't really get a chance to see them because they were they are booked according to the nurses availability. We might train this one today and then tomorrow other one comes and that one is not trained. And in giving medication for this patient, it's not gonna, only gonna be an issue of giving the medication. It's uh, uh, the, the, the nurse uh, doctor uh, um, relationship is advised because of the, of, of, of the dose adjustments. So one must really check and the doctors, when they change the medication, they must communicate with the nurse because not every time that the nurse will check, but if the doctor like, has indicated that, look, I'm changing the, the, the dose of this patient, now it's not going to be QID, giving the first situation, it's only maybe going to be PT, that needs to be communicated well. As I've mentioned earlier on that, um, the pill burden is very high for this patient. If you look at the, the, the number of, med of, of medication that they are giving, because they might be also be on TB medication. There's also maybe gonna be Bactrim, there's Bactrim, and then there's, there's maybe gonna be Maxolon if the patient is, is, is having nausea and vomiting. There's supplements, slow K and, and, and slow K that we we're giving. And maybe, um, Maybe the patient is also on, on, on ARVs. So in overall, when you're looking uh, after the patient with cocal meningitis, you must like just know that you are looking after a very sick patient that needs a very close monitoring. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sipakazi, for sharing uh, your, your experiences and, and challenges um, in this condition with us. Um, so I, I had intended to give a talk, but we are running out of time, and I do want uh, to have time for our panel discussion. So I'm not going to show the slides. I'm just going to share what my take-home message was uh, with the audience, which uh, just to focus on the issue of raised intracranial pressure. Uh, which manifests with headaches, depressed level of consciousness, uh, ophthalmoplegias and visual disturbance um, in, in patients with cryptococcal meningitis. Obviously, when patients present with those signs and symptoms, the, the management is therapeutic lumbar punctures to measure the opening pressure and relieve the raised intracranial pressure with uh, the um, uh, taking of 10 to 30 moles of CSF. And that is often required to be done daily in patients to relieve symptoms. Uh, uh, the uh, therapeutic lumbar punches have been shown to reduce mortality, they reduce uh, neurological morbidity and, and potentially reduce the risk of blindness and certainly relieve symptoms as we heard uh, from Sikona in, in the uh, video. Um, one, the, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is the focus um, you know, based on the findings of, ambition, uh, of the ambition trial has been on the uh, drug management of cryptococcal meningitis, but you know, I really want to emphasize to clinicians that the management of cryptococcal meningitis has to be seen comprehensively. It's not just about the drug management. The uh, other aspects are key, and we've heard about some of those from Sepagazi and Kyla, but a critical component of the management is uh, assessing patients with raised intracranial pressure and doing therapeutic lumbar punctures sometimes daily to uh, manage that. Um, and the other reason for that, for, for bringing this up, is one of the temptations from the findings of the ambition trial is to say that it only involves a single intravenous dose of, of amphotericin B and there might be a potential to discharge from pa uh, patients from hospital earlier. And the risk of that is that patients might then have suboptimal management of their raised intracranial pressure and not get the therapeutic lumbar punctures that are required. Sometimes patients only need their first therapeutic lumbar puncture a few days into, into admission. 
So if patients are going to be discharged, one must make sure that they don't have symptoms of raised intracranial pressure, if they're going to be discharged early, um, and have a plan for them to come back to hospital for a therapeutic lumbar puncture if they do develop symptoms. And obviously, if they live far away, one should really carefully consider whether they should remain in hospital for observation for the development of raised intracranial pressure uh, for that week. So that's just to really emphasize that we don't want these findings to lead to primitive discharge from hospital and suboptimal management of raised intracranial pressure. That's, that, that's the kind of take home message from the talk that I, I, I was going to give. And it, um, I, I think that summarizes, uh, you know, the, the key points that I wanted to make. I want to move on to the panel discussion now. And uh, you've uh, been introduced to all of the panelists, uh, apart from uh, David Lawrence. And David was uh, the lead clinician on the ambition trial and really supported all of the sites um, across uh, the, the, the trial in, in five African countries and, and presented the findings at the IAS. Um, and I want to ask David the, 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 um, the first question, uh, just to uh, ask, your, you've obviously conducted the trial now, there are the findings out there. What do you think the challenges are in terms of implementing them and access uh, more broadly in Africa? Thanks, Graeme, for the for the question and also for the invitation to speak at the panel. Um, I think first and foremost, the largest, the first big challenge really is going to be around access to to liposomal amphotericin to ambisome. Uh, so at present, it's registered in very few countries in southern and eastern Africa, uh, and where it is registered, it's extremely expensive. Um, so I think we did procure a, a bit of ambisone locally during the trial, and if I'm not mistaken, it cost roughly 2,700 rand per vial, uh, which I'd take to be about 186 US dollars. Uh, and that makes this regimen quite prohibitively expensive, as you can imagine. Now, the real challenge going forward is the fact that Gilead have previously committed, as Prof Jarvis discussed um, when presenting the results, to an expanded access program to Ambisome for HIV-associated cryptococcal meningitis at a cost price of $16.25, uh, which is, you know, less than 10% of the cost and it would be available uh, in South Africa currently. Uh, and really, the, the, the need is for this drug to be registered and available at that cost uh, across um, countries with, with a, a high incidence of cryptococcal meningitis. I think that's going to be the main factor. Uh, the second, of course, is also the access to the 5FC itself, um, uh, which we've had quite a lot of discussion about already today. So I won't go over that. Uh, but just to emphasize, of course, the importance of the access to the 5FC. Um, so I think those are the two main uh, challenges for implementation. It, in terms of the, the response to the results and the integration of these findings into guidelines, of course, that's something that needs to happen with the peer review um, of the full, the full results when they're presented. Uh, and that's for kind of each um, individual country to address uh, and also the World Health Organization too. Um, we're hopeful that uh, all of these committees will look very favorably on the clinical um, efficacy of this regimen. Uh, so we don't hopefully see that as being too much of a barrier to implementation. Uh, so really it's going to be around the access to the drugs. Um, and just one final point as well, which Prof Jarvis touched on, is, is the cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, this is something that we are trying to work on as quickly as we possibly can. Obviously it's been a bit of a short timeline from the closure of the study to the presentation of the results and where we are now. Uh, so our efforts are really on the, the costing so that we can also provide um, a very robust argument for implementation from, from an economic perspective as well. Thanks, thanks very much for those, those thoughts, uh, David. Um, if I can move on to the next question, um, and uh, perhaps Kyla, if you could address this, just uh, just to uh, repeat the, the point that you made about tenofovir and amphotericin. Yes, thanks, Graham. So um, it used to be recommended that patients who are on tenofovir-based ART at the time that they present with cryptococcal meningitis should be switched to an alternative regimen for the sake of preserving the renal function. And that's obviously related to the risk of renal toxicity with uh, amphotericin B. But with patients now taking usually shorter regimens of amphotericin B and with close monitoring of renal function, um, patients 
the recommendation is that patients should stay on their tenofovir based regimen if it is an effective regimen. So with the caveat that they are biologically suppressed at the time of presentation and that renal function can just be monitored. Um, so it's um, it's no longer recommended that these patients be switched, especially if the patients are using um, flucytosine as well. Changing the patient to, for example, AZT is not going to actually provide any benefit, but is also going to have shared toxicity. So um, there's no real um, re recommendation to switch them off to Nofiva anymore. Okay, thanks, Carla. Um, so th then, Joe, can I ask you to address the question, has anyone investigated ambizone plus flucytosine versus ambizone versus amphodeoxycholate plus fl uh, flucytosine for a week, uh, followed by fluconazole as, as induction therapy? Yeah, so I think the, the question is, could we just give a seven-day course of ambisome or a seven-day course of amphotericin yeah. deoxycholate with flucytosine? Uh, nobody has investigated that. So there have been trials comparing two weeks of uh, standard dose ambisome to two weeks of amphotericin B deoxycholate. Those studies didn't really show any, um, certainly no superiority of ambisome over amphotericin B deoxycholate in that setting, although as you'd expect, the toxicity was less with the ambisome compared to the deoxycholate. Now, I think what we've shown in our phase two study is that you get as good a fungicidal activity with a single 10 milligram per kilogram dose of ambisome as you do with 14 days of, um, of ambisome uh, dosed, uh, daily dosing. So I'd imagine that if we just gave seven daily doses compared to the single dose, there's no reason to expect seven days to be better than 14. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the same would apply. So therefore, knowing that our 10 mg per kg dose is as effective as 14 days and by extension as effective as seven days, and the fact that we're giving, if you gave three mg per kg for seven days, that's 21 milligrams of ambisome. If we give a single 10 mg per kg dose, that's less than half the amount. I can see no reason now with the ambition results out why you'd want to give seven days of standard dosed ambisome over the single dose. So I'd advocate for giving a single dose of ambisome in every setting, really. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. Um, and then could I ask Sipa Kaisi, um, regarding the mixing of ambisome, um, can can you speak to some of the challenges that that the nursing staff might have had with her? Uh, yes, Prof. Um, when it comes to mixing the ambisome, it's, it's quite a lot of files, and you need to be to make sure that it's, 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 it's a, the prescription of the of the ambisome is the correct amount of files that be in a good uh, relation with the pharmacy just to double check because they will come maybe in 10 vials and then you need to, you need a vials. So, because on the, on, on, on the ampo we put on like um, 10 mils of sterile water, but then on the, on, on the ambizome we put about uh, 12 mils of, of, ster of sterile water. So it's quite a lot. Mm -hmm. of, so, we really need to train our nurses because it's a lot of files that one must mix. And then the mixing and 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 and, 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 and then the mixing of the of, of the ambisome and then um you need to 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 infiltrate it into the into the into the into, into the vacuum. So it's not just mixing and and, and and drawing and put it back. So you must actually strain the ambisome. So you need those filters as well when you are mixing the ambisome. So it's very different with amphot with with, with, with amphotericin. So there, there were a lot of challenges. And in overall, the nurses, they said, like, it's hard work. I, 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 if it's going to be introduced, they really need to go for, like, training course because it's not yeah. easy to mix ambisome. And how long did it, how yes. long did it take um, for to prepare? It will take, it will take you a good hour, Prof. If you are mixing it all by yourself, it will take you a good hour. But luckily mm -hmm. enough, in our own ambition, we were two, and the doctors were trained to how to mix ambisome. So mm -hmm. it was like a doctor and the nurse who were helping each other. Yeah. Okay. Yes, bro. Okay, so, so that's a key implementation consideration is, is wow. ensuring that people are aware of, of the time that it takes and, and get the training. Obviously, it's a single dose, so uh, that, that's the benefit of, of having to do it uh, for seven days um, yeah, or 14 days. Uh, that, that you're spending that time just on a single dose. But uh, thanks for sharing that. 
Um, yes. And uh, Eunice just raises the Thank point. You, Thank you. Should the mixing uh, not be taken over by the pharmacist? And that's certainly something that we would need to think about. Obviously, this was being done uh, in a trial setting, but once it's implemented in the service, um, you know, I think that, that would be a consideration. Um, so uh, we, we've run over a bit, and um, I, I think we've heard from all the panelists, and we've addressed the questions that came through the chat. Um, and um, just to say thank you very much to all of the speakers and the panelists. I think it's been a, a really excellent session. We've heard about uh, the um, findings from the landmark ambition trial. We've heard uh, some of the, the clinical issues uh, and the complexity of, of managing uh, patients with cryptococcal meningitis. We've heard from a patient about their experience and um, had some discussion uh, about these issues. So to, to wrap up, I'm going to hand over to Carol Ruffle from DNDI Southern Africa, who will make some closing remarks. Great, thanks, Graham. Um, and so I'm going to keep it very short, really, just to, on behalf of DNDI and our co-host for the session, Chai, thank you to all the presenters uh, and the people behind the scenes who've made this pull together. Um, so Eunice, Graham, and Jürgen for moderating, so thank you. And as DNDI, we look forward to continue to contribute to the space, um, both from an advocacy point of view and, and then our research and development work on slow release formulation. And uh, really wish you all a very good conference uh, for the next